The Democrats gain in congressional polling as November approaches, and the media are eager to chalk it up to dark Biden. Americans remain in the dark about the FBI's raid on Donald Trump, and Lizzo's defenders come to her rescue after a comedian tells jokes about her. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Thousands of my listeners have already secured their network data. Join them at expressvpn.com slash Ben. We'll get to all the news in just one moment. First, does it make sense to give your internet activity to a company that's going to use your internet activity against you? Yeah, the simple fact of the matter is that a lot of people who are monitoring what you do online and they're using it to make money off of you. And then they are saying on large national podcasts that they actually use that data in order to suppress stories. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg literally said that to Joe Rogan the other day. So why exactly are you giving companies like Facebook all of your information? Instead, use ExpressVPN and protect yourself online the same way that I do. Think about how much of your life is on the internet. Sadly, every site you visit, video you watch, or message you send gets tracked and data mined. But when you run ExpressVPN on your device, the software hides your IP address, something big tech can use to personally identify you. So ExpressVPN makes your activity harder to trace and sell to advertisers. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your internet data to keep you safe from hackers and eavesdroppers on your network. And ExpressVPN does all of that without slowing your connection, which is why it's rated the number one VPN service by both Mashable and Tech Radar. What I like most about ExpressVPN, it's really easy to use. Download the app on your phone or computer. You tap one button, you are now protected. So stop handing over your personal data to the big tech monopoly that mines your activity and sells your info. Protect yourself with the VPN I trust to keep myself safe online. Visit expressvpn.com slash Ben. Get three extra months for free. Go to expressvpn.com slash Ben right now to learn more. expressvpn.com slash Ben. Well, a cloud of disquiet has now lowered itself upon the Republican Party. The Republican Party thought that they were just going to run away with the 2022 election cycle. It no longer looks like this is the case. According to Nate Silver, there is now a two-thirds chance that the Republicans lose the Senate. And they are favored, of course, to win the House because they have a very, very small gap in the House. It'd be almost impossible for them not to take back the House. But the kind of wave election that people were talking about even six weeks ago, no longer appears to be on the horizon for the Republicans. There are a bunch of factors that are responsible for this. The media are trying to chalk it up to the rise of dark Biden. The idea being that Joe Biden is just a magic, magic man. And he has somehow revived himself before he was a dead body, like lying prone in the corner. Now he's active, man. He's got his Inflation Reduction Act that doesn't reduce inflation and also spends an enormous amount of money. He's doing his student loan bailouts. And those are going to get people really jazzed to go out to the polls. It's all about dark Biden. They've revived this meme that actually started on the Trumpian right about Joe Biden. It was a joke about Joe Biden basically no longer being a sentient human being. And it started off, I believe, actually, the original dark Biden meme started off as a as a Chinese cartoon about Joe Biden being like a dark lord, uh, an edge lord. And so there are all of these memes that are out and about about, about Joe Biden, and they show him with glowing eyes and and shooting lasers from his face and all this kind of stuff. I mean, here is, is, for example, a dark Biden meme video that has become very popular. You can see, uh, oh, there he is, Joe Biden, sitting atop a a Game of Thrones-style throne with zombies in the foreground. This apparently started again as, as a sort of Chinese cartoon. And the dark Biden memes have been coming fast and furious. And the idea being that he is actually amazing at this. He's actually secretly an amazing president, a dark lord who has powers beyond human recognition and all of the rest of this sort of stuff. You know, him as a pirate, all the rest of it. And it, it, it's kind of funny in the sense that he's no longer with us. Now, like Every time he talks, you're like, I don't even know what this human being is anymore. And of course, that, maybe that's the irony of the dark Biden memes is that is that Joe Biden is no longer with us. I mean, he's actually being steered around by his wife. There was video that emerged over the weekend of Joe Biden being physically guided by Jill backwards. Like Joe Biden is standing near the media. She walks up behind him and she starts backing him away from the media. So, I mean, the idea that this is like dark Lord Joe Biden, again, it's creation of the online memory, but it underscores what Democrats actually think about this guy. Now, the reality, of course, is that he is not with us. And he is, he is, El Cid, they have propped him on a horse and he is a corpse and they're just moving him around at this point. There he is. And there comes Jill and she's backing him away. Like the fact that no one comments on this is really astonishing to me. I'm sorry. That's super funny. Like that he's standing there and she like backs him away the way I would my child. This is like what I would do with my two-year-old. You're too close. You're too close to the sink. And then just kind of back her away. But according to the Democrats, Dark Lord Biden is back. Again, the polls are showing 
that the Democrats are making a comeback here. According to the Wall Street Journal, Republicans remain the favorites to win control of the House of Representatives in the midterm elections. But Democrats, who for over a year have braced for large losses, are finishing the summer in a stronger position than where they started. Public polling and recent election results are prompting Democrats and nonpartisan election observers and some Republicans to expect a more competitive battle this fall. Republicans need just a handful of seat pickups to take over the House, which Democrats currently control 220 to 211. There are four vacancies. Nathan Gonzalez and Jacob Rubashkin of Inside Elections, a nonpartisan election watcher, say, quote, the party in power typically doesn't improve its electoral prospects in the final months of a midterm, but that's where we appear to be. The analysts cited various factors helping Democrats as they try to close the gap. Those include the fight over abortion access, weak GOP candidates in key races, investigations focused on Donald Trump, and a recent drop in gasoline prices. They added that districts that Biden carried by at least 10 percentage points seemed more out of reach for the GOP than at this point last year. And that's, of course, correct. There's a lot of talk again, six months ago, that anything that was within a D plus 10 was a Republican pickup opportunity. Now it looks like unless it's like a D plus five or less, that's going to remain in Democratic hands. The nonpartisan Cook Political Report lowered its projection for GOP pickups to the range of 10 to 20 seats, which would win the chamber. But that is way down from 15 to 30 seats. Cook said he couldn't rule out the possibility that the Democrats retain their majority, citing elevated Democratic turnout. Jamie Harrison, the chair of the DNC, predicted on Sunday the midterms will see Democrats gain seat in the U.S. Senate, pick up some governor's mansions, and hold on to their majority in the House of Representatives. He says the momentum is real. And by polling data, the momentum is, in fact, real. I mean, again, Nate Silver is now suggesting that there's a two-thirds possibility that the Republicans actually lose the Senate, You know that, that the Democrats retain control of the Senate, and he's suggesting a better than average chance that the Democrats lose a very small number of seats in the House. Meanwhile, the Senate GOP is apparently already abandoning a bunch of key Senate races. According to Politico, Senate Republicans' primary super PAC is canceling a $10 million ad buy in Arizona, raising questions about the party's commitment to Blake Masters. That's the Senate nominee in the Copper State. Mark Kelly is the current seat holder there. So this means that there are several states where Democrats should be highly vulnerable, where they just do not appear to be nearly as vulnerable as they were thought to be. John Fetterman, who is no longer alive. John Fetterman is walking around like young Frankenstein's monsters, Peter Boyle doing the shuffle. And he is right now up on Mehmet Oz in Pennsylvania. You have Raphael Warnock, who's a disaster area of a candidate, who is still up on Herschel Walker, another disaster area of a candidate in Georgia. You have Mark Kelly, who is right now up on Blake Masters in Arizona. And all three of those races are races that should have swung to the Republicans. So again, about a two-thirds shot that the Republicans don't take the Senate, which means they really, really need to take the House. And by the way, they need a margin in the House. Because if you have a margin of like four or five seats in the House, it isn't that hard for Democrats to peel off four or five Republicans to vote for some of their favorite priorities. So the fact that the Republicans are are pulling out of places like Arizona obviously is showing a a certain amount of, of weakness. Well, you know, Democrats keep insisting they are doing better because of Joe Biden, the magic of Joe Biden. That is not true. But I'll tell you something that is true. If you would like your underwear to be better, you have but one choice. Tommy John. If you can't take the heat, get out of your old stifling underwear. The only way to play it cool this summer is with Tommy John. When you wear Tommy John, you are that much cooler. So you can do everything better thanks to breathable lightweight fabric with four times the stretch of competing brands. Tommy John's breathable lightweight fabric keeps you two to three times cooler and dries four to five times faster than regular cotton. Their Apollo underwear keeps you up to seven degrees cooler than cotton as well. With dozens of comfort innovations, Tommy John will keep you looking and feeling cool all season long from lounging at home to summertime fun. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics. With over 17 million pairs sold, people love their Tommy John underwear and loungewear as well. And Tommy John doesn't just make you feel cooler. You actually are cooler. You can step to seven degrees cooler than cotton in Tommy John's Apollo underwear. Plus, there's no risk because you're covered with Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or it's free guarantee. Shop TommyJohn.com slash Ben right now for 20% off your very first order. Get 20% off right now at TommyJohn.com slash Ben. Again, it's the only underwear I wear. It graces this magnificent tuchus at this precise moment. TommyJohn.com slash Ben. See site for details. Now, as I say, Democrats are trying to attribute this mainly to Joe Biden, but there are several factors here. So Charles Blow, who's the worst columnist in America, he writes for the New York Times. I'm not sure he's ever written a correct thing. He has a piece today at the New York Times titled, Biden becomes a boon for Democrats. He says, the coattail effect in politics is the theory that the popularity of a candidate at the top of the ticket redounds to the benefit of those in the same party down ballot. You vote Democratic for president, you might vote Democratic for Senate or mayor. But what do you call it when a person from whom the benefit flows is not actually on the ballot? What if the person isn't even personally that popular? Let's call it phantom coattails. This is what I believe is happening with President Biden at the moment. Now, you don't have to call it anything else. It is the coattail effect because, again, the president's approval rating has a very heavy correlation with how his party does in the midterm elections. But says Charles Blow, Joe Biden's string of successes is building momentum and shaking off narratives of ineffectiveness. 
Last week, he announced the federal government would forgive billions of dollars of student loan debt. Republicans predictably squawked about it being an unfair giveaway. Progressives complained the plan didn't go far enough, but Biden did act. He did fulfill his campaign promise to a degree. That is crucial. After some major losses on liberal priorities like voter protections and police reform, voters needed more wins. It wasn't Biden's fault his agenda was blocked. For that, the blame goes to obstructionist Republicans and demi-Democrats like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. There was, however, a sense setting in that electing an elderly institutionalist meant he wasn't filled with enough fight, that he was guided by a sort of geriatric gentility. Biden's recent wins put a major dent in those perceptions and are changing how people feel about him. According to 538's poll of polls, his approval rating, while still underwater, has been trending up for the past month. This week, it reached 44%, the highest it has been in a year. Again, they keep championing this 44% number. That is a bad number. Guys, hey, Donald Trump's midterm election numbers in 2018 were about 44%. And the Democrats ended up taking a bunch of seats. So this notion that, that Joe Biden's approval rating is really what is driving this, that's not true. So what exactly is driving all of this? Well, the thing, as it turns out, that is driving all of this is, is not underlying systemic Republican weakness. It is not underlying Democratic strength. What is underlying all of this is a couple of extraneous factors that are playing into the election. Extraneous factor number one is abortion. As we've seen, we've seen four special elections since the Dobbs decision was, was brought down by the Supreme Court overruling Roe versus Wade. In all four of those elections, Democrats have overperformed in these special elections. It's a very, very clear pattern. Before that, Republicans were actually outperforming. Now, after that, there are four special elections and Democrats have outperformed in each one of those. Okay, so that is obviously one major factor. According to 538, the special election, I can give you the special election results right here, the timeline. So the margin swing in terms of where the partisan lean was in a district to where the vote margin was in special elections, here are the results from 2022. So in January of 2022, there was a swing in Florida's 20th from a D plus 53 district to a D plus 60 district. So D plus seven, but that was a hugely Democratic district. And then you had California's 22nd district in June, this is early June of 2022. It went from an R plus 11 district to an R plus 24 district. This has a Republican shift by 14 points. And then you had the Texas 34th district, which shifted from D plus five to R plus five, right? That was widely noted. That was an R plus 10 swing. Okay, since Dobbs, You've had four special elections in Nebraska's first district. That was an R plus 17 district. The Republican was supposed to run away with it. The Republican did win, but only by five. So that was a D plus 12 swing. August 9th, you had an election in Minnesota's first. That was an R plus 15 district. The Republican only won by four. So that was a D plus 11 swing. August 23rd, you had two elections in New York. One was an R plus four district. And the Democrat actually won the seat. That turned into a D plus two district. So that was a D plus six swing. And there was New York's 23rd district, where it went from an R plus 15 district to an R plus 7 district, which means a Democratic nine-point swing. So you're talking about significant swings in favor of Democrats and ignoring the writing on the wall here is a mistake. Obviously, Dobbs is playing a role. But what is not playing the main role here is that Joe Biden is a good president, or that Joe Biden is wildly popular, or that Joe Biden is blowing wind into the sails of the Democratic Party, or that this revised dream of the new Democratic majority is back online. So again, there are two myths about American politics that have been driving each side. So there's a myth about American politics on the left, and there's a myth about American politics on the right. The myth about American politics on the left was propagated by Barack Obama in 2012 in the entire Democratic media. And that myth was there was a new majority, minority, plus college-educated white liberals coalition, and it was going to win from here till the end of time. When Barack Obama won in 2012, that was the narrative that emerged. And it turns out that that narrative is false. But because that has been the narrative, this is why Democrats have said it was impossible for Hillary Clinton to lose in 2016. After all, we have systemic advantages, right? We have a new majority minority coalition. There is no way we could possibly lose an election like we did in 2016. It must have been stolen. Now, on the right, there was a, a sort of countervailing myth. And that myth was buying into the Democrats' myth. It was, you know, they're right. There is this new emerging Democratic minority coalition. And what this means is we have to stop minorities from coming into the country. And it also means that if somebody on the Republican side of the aisle wins, if Donald Trump wins, it's because he's a magic person. He has, the, the ability, he has magic that flows through him. And this magic means that he is the only one who can win. Right? That magic is defeating the dark magic of the Democrats. Right? This is sort of the, the narrative box into which we have put ourselves. The problem is that entire narrative is wrong. And it's having consequences for both sides of the aisle, ironically enough. It's really kind of fascinating. A lot of people believe this myth about American politics, the emerging Democratic minority majority. But 
there's one myth that you should not believe, and that is that you have no financial options these days. A lot of people think, you know, the economy is narrowing. What exactly am I supposed to do? Well, if you're considering a new home purchase this year, this message is for you. Did you know you can lock your mortgage rate in before you start home shopping? That is correct. You can lock it for up to 120 days when you work with American Financing, which makes a lot of sense because those interest rates are rising. You're getting peace of mind as you search for the perfect home. You don't miss out on the best deal once you're ready to make an offer, but it doesn't end there. They also provide a no-pressure, no-obligation lending experience. From custom loans to fast closings and everything in between, their salary-based mortgage consultants really can do it all. They can even help you refinance later so you experience greater savings when the market gets better. So don't put that new home off any longer. Instead, get the pre-approval process started right now by calling 866-721-3300. That's 866-721-3300. 866-721-3300 or visit AmericanFinancing.net and MLS 182334 and MLSConsumerAccess.org. Go check them out right now. Give them a call 866-721-3300. Get that pre-approval process started today. 866-721-3300 or visit AmericanFinancing.net. So there's a great interview with Roy Teixeira. I've quoted Roy Teixeira on this program before because he's a really interesting thinker. Roy Teixeira was one of the originators of the new Democratic Majority Minority Coalition. Back in 2003, he wrote a book with John Judas called The New Democratic Majority, the Emerging Democrat Majority, I think was the name of the book. And he has since recanted that. He has since said that just doesn't exist. So he explained in in an interview with the Wall Street Journal over the weekend why exactly this new emerging Democratic Majority never actually emerged. He says the Democrats still dominate the minority vote, but you're starting to see minorities turn away from the Democrats. In Mr. Teixeira's view, according to the Wall Street Journal, Democrats in the Obama years, quote, had a better idea about how to appeal to so-called people of color. First, they didn't call them people of color. It was more like, we're all in this together. We're Americans, black, white, whatever, red states, blue states. We want to have an America where everybody can rise up together. By contrast, Teixeira quotes the anti-racist scholar Ibram X. Kendi. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. This isn't a new idea. Just as Harry Blackman, borrowing from Ford Foundation President Mick George Bundy, wrote in Regents of the United of the University of California versus Bakke in 78, quote, In order to get beyond racism, we must first take account of race. There is no other way. And in order to treat some persons equally, we must must treat them differently. Even these blunt sentiments seem genteel compared with what Mr. Teixeira reports having heard lately from erstwhile colleagues on the left. Quote, you're going to tell all white people in this country they have white privilege and we're a white supremacist society and that we're all guilty of microaggressions every day in every way. Not only is this substantively wrong, in my opinion, but as politics, it's bat bleep crazy. You can't win if people think that's where you're coming from. What country do you think you're living in? Teixeira acknowledges that this is a development that the emerging Democratic majority failed to foresee. Quote, we didn't anticipate the extent to which cultural liberalism might segue into cultural radicalism and the extent to which that view, particularly as driven by younger cohorts, would wind up imprinting itself on the entire infrastructure in and around the Democratic Party, the advocacy groups, the foundations, academia, of course, certainly the lower and middle levels of the Democratic Party infrastructure itself. A decade ago, says Teixeira, quote, the typical response of people on the left when you bring this up was, oh, it's just crazy kids in the universities. Not to worry, once they get out on the real world, they'll act a bit differently. It's like a fad, like goldfish swallowing or something. That turned out to be so wrong. They came out in large numbers. They didn't give up their points of view. They pressed them vigorously, and more and more of them came out of the universities. If Democrats stand for unacceptable ideas and are openly contemptuous of enormous numbers of their fellow citizens, how do they manage to win elections at all? That's an easy one. Republicans have some unpopular ideas, too. And in, in, in any election, voters are constrained to consider the alternative. So what does Teixeira say? He says, both parties have problems, deep problems, in terms of being able to develop a stable majority coalition. He says the Democrats' difficulties may actually run deeper. Many of the Republican Party's current problems revolve around the figure of Trump and personalized Trumpism. If Republicans can get rid of or sideline that one figure, they might suddenly have a relatively clear path to developing an appeal to the center of the American electorate. His warning to Democrats is, you won't always have Trump to kick around. You're going to have to deal with smarter, better versions of a similar thing. Okay, so... The point here is that what is happening in terms of the Democrats kind of regaining steam right before the election is not the revivification of the Democratic dream of this majority minority coalition that is largely driven by radical excesses in the base. That is not going to win elections. And yet Democrats continue to double down on this. And they continue to be driven in sort of cultural political terms, not by the moderates in their coalition, but by the radicals in their coalition, by a constant narrative that there is victimization occurring at the broadest levels in the American Republic, and that this victimization is is what lies behind nearly all structures of power in the United States. You can see it everywhere. You can see this from Hillary Clinton, standard bearer in 2016, to Lizzo. Over the weekend, this is really, really funny, Hillary Clinton, who's been trying to reemerge on the political stage, as we've been talking about, she has a documentary that is coming out with Apple TV, in which she basically feats herself 
as a wondrously brave human being. Well, now she's tweeting out support for the prime minister of Finland, Santa Marin, who was on videotape at a party where people were making drug jokes, dancing in a rather provocative fashion. And um, Hillary Clinton tweeted out a photo of herself dancing when she was secretary of state in drunken fashion, saying, quote, as Ann Richards said, Ginger Rogers did everything that Fred Astaire did. She just did it backwards and in high heels. Here's me in in Cartagena while I was there for a meeting as secretary of state. Keep dancing, Marin Santa. And Marin Santa then responded, thank you, Hillary Clinton, heart emoji. So again, this idea that all women are victimized, they're all victimized, it's just so terrible. She's a, women are victimized. And same thing from Lizzo. So the Video Music Awards, which I'm not sure anybody watches anymore, but are still a thing. Lizzo won an award for Video for Good. I don't know what that means. And apparently neither did Lizzo. And she gets up and she talks about how victimized everybody is. If you're talking about the new woke coalition inside the Democratic Party, this is a pretty, pretty good indicator. But here is, um, here is Lizzo. Uh, music video for good means, but I do know what your vote means, and that's a f- lot. Your vote means everything to me. It means everything to making a change in this country. So remember, when you're voting for your favorite artist, vote to change some of these laws that are oppressing us. It's hard to think of a less oppressed figure than uh, than Lizzo, particularly. I'm not sure exactly what she is wearing there. Particularly, I'm I'm always puzzled by the generalized trend, not unique to Lizzo, of wearing an earring that goes to your nose. I just don't understand why that's in any way supposed to be an attractive. It's hard to think of a less oppressed human being than that human. But again, she is oppressed. Right? The idea from the Democratic coalition, both culturally and politically, is that we are the coalition of the oppressed, and the coalition of the oppressed is going to rise up and this coalition is going to take back the heart of American power. And this is a danger to the Democrats. The more they preach that, the more they lose. And so the Democrats have this, that, that, that emerging Democratic majority theory still has not died in Democratic circles, which is why everybody has to remain a victim. In fact, that hierarchy of victimhood inside the Democratic Party is a competitive thing. The more victimized you are, the higher you rank in Democratic politics. While we're on the subject of Lizzo, by the way, I noticed that there is a comedian named Ari Spears who is now in all sorts of trouble for quote unquote victimizing Lizzo, who again is a very not oppressed human being. Lizzo is extraordinarily rich. She is wearing probably a $10,000 dress holding an actual metal idol while being cheered by throngs. But apparently she's oppressed because somebody told a joke about the fact that she is, she is fat. Well, Lizzo is not a very oppressed person. She's just not. But she says that she is. We'll get to that in a moment. First, let's talk about your safety and security at home. I mean, you don't want to be invaded at home. No, nobody wants that. You don't want any breaking into your house. Right? These are very obvious things. You can count on Ring to keep your home safe. Now, you're thinking to yourself, wait, don't they just do the video doorbell so that I know who's at my front door? Yes, but they also can protect your entire home with Ring Alarm. Ring Alarm is an award-winning home security system with available professional monitoring when you subscribe. Best of all, you can easily install it yourself. And Ring didn't stop there. They've changed the home security game entirely with Ring Alarm Pro. That's why I've decided to team up with Ring. When it comes to protecting my home, I've gone pro with Ring Alarm Pro. Ring Alarm Pro is whole home security with available professional monitoring when you subscribe to Ring Protect Pro. Ring Alarm Pro combines that security system with a fast Eero Wi-Fi 6 router for home security and network security all in one device. Plus, with a Ring Protect Pro subscription, which is an amazing deal, by the way, because I have it, I get professional monitoring for the ultimate peace of mind. If something happens, professional monitoring will call me and can request emergency services, whether I'm in town or out of town, just out of the house. This busy summer season to protect my home, I've gone pro with Ring Alarm Pro, so can you. Learn more at ring.com forward slash Ben. That is ring.com forward slash Ben. I hate to break it to the world, but Lizzo is overweight. I know this is groundbreaking stuff here. I mean, literally like it cracks the ground, but she, she is a, she's an overweight person. The, the funniest thing about our culture, by the way, is that if Lizzo says, I am fat and I am sex positive, I'm a fat sex positive female. Everybody's like, yeah. And if I say she is a fat sex positive female, everybody's like, no, <laughs> you're, not allowed to, you're not allowed to repeat the thing she just said. Anyway, Ari Spears is a comedian. He told jokes about her. You're not allowed to tell jokes about the fact that Lizzo is overweight. So here is Aries Spears, again, apparently a a man of color who is oppressing a woman of color because, again, it's just a competition of oppressiveness here in the United States. Here is uh, is Aries Spears saying the unsayable. Yo, you know somebody that actually made good music, man? Lizzo. Lizzo? Yeah, bro. Have you heard her, yo? Like, as a songwriter, yo. I I can't get past the fact that she looks like the emoji. 
<laughs> Yo. Very beautiful girl. She got a very pretty face, but she keeps showing her body off. Like, come on, man. I'm sorry. Listen, I ain't the most in shape in the world, but I still, you know, when you funny and you got swagger and confidence and, and you decent looking, I think I'm at least handsome, you get but a woman that's built like a plate of mashed potatoes is in trouble. Musically, yo, she go hard, man. She a good songwriter, though. Oh, yo, she's, yeah, she's dope. Her music hard, her body ain't. So he got ripped up and down. How did, people were so mad at, how, how, how dare he notice? How dare he notice? And people are tweeting out, Ari Spears, a fat black man out of breath while sitting and talking, discussing diabetes and being fat, aimed at Lizzo, who performs and sings while being fat, is insane. But he actually said, the rest of the clip is, he talks about why is it that everybody is, is praising her for being large when, in fact, one of the biggest problems in the United States is, is the problems with obesity. He said, F diabetes, F heart problems, F heart disease. F cholesterol. Y'all claim womanhood and about sisterhood and support for your sister, you know, when it comes to that ridiculous bleep. But if you really gave a bleep, why wouldn't you go, black girl, we love your confidence, boo-boo, but this ain't it, they ain't it. That's the real love. Y'all jump on me for making jokes, but y'all won't be effing real and go, sister, put the eclair down. <laughs> this ain't it. It's treadmill time. Uh, by the way, he's not wrong that we have a society in which we, we actively praise people for being massively over. You saw this happen not with regard to Lizzo. It's happened with Adele. And Adele was overweight. She lost a bunch of weight and people were mad at her for losing the weight because it's more important that everybody be considered a victim of society. And so the best way to be a victim of society is to victimize yourself by being overweight. And then everybody points out that you're overweight. You make a point of you being overweight and being famous because you're, I mean, like Lizzo is not exactly not trading on the fact that she's overweight. That's one of her draws, not gravitationally, but, but actually like that's one of her business draws is the fact that she is overweight. We all, the stupidest game in our culture is look at me. I'm a I'm a, a groundbreaking, unique artist who is doing this crazy thing. Notice me. And then we're like, yeah, we notice. And, and we think that's probably not like great for the culture. Like, how dare you? You have to praise it. That's the only way. So people are very mad at Ari Spears for pointing this out. Somebody else tweeted, Ari Spears is ugly, unfunny, and has no swagger or confidence, but he's speaking on a black woman's looks. Bleep, you are sweating while sitting down. You could never complete one of Lizzo's dance routines, but you want to talk about diabetes and high cholesterol? I'm I'm still confused. Is it good to be at least 100 pounds overweight? Like, is it a general thing? Are we supposed to pretend that Lizzo is traditionally beautiful? Is that is that required of it? Is it is required of this culture? When, by the way, when 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 you see the cultural arbiters strenuously screaming to the sky that a person is beautiful, forget about Lizzo, just generally that a person is beautiful. When this becomes a point of contention, that a person is beautiful, so beautiful, unbelievably beautiful. What that means is that the person's not beautiful because nobody's ever had to say that about like Heidi Klum in her heyday or Tyra Banks in her heyday. Like no one ever had to say, you know who's beautiful? Tyra Banks. Like, yeah, right. Because, uh-huh. <laughs> but again, the, the sort of oppressiveness is, is a political thing. And that political thing is not going to win Democrats any point. And it's not, so it's, it's, it's not what is driving Democrats and their upswing here is obviously not systemic factors that are sort of ideological or cultural in nature. It is not Joe Biden. In fact, a Florida Democratic candidate named Annette Tadea was, was asked on national television whether she wants Joe Biden to campaign with her. And she was like, well, no. President Biden's approval rating has hovered close to 40 percent, usually below 40 percent. Would you like to see him come down to campaign with you? Look, I know that I have my own campaign to win and we will uh, get lots of help from lots of people. But at the end of the day, I know that the way that I win this race is by us actually telling my story, telling why we need a real representative. That's a no. That's a Joe Biden should stay far, far away. So it's not dark Biden and it's not the cultural upswing on behalf of the Democrats, their cultural radicalism, as uh, Roy Teixeira points out, is not beneficial to their coalition. And it's not Joe Biden's radical policies. Right? Bernie Sanders is still out there promoting this student debt relief. And he's saying that he wants public colleges tuition free. This sort of stuff ain't going to win Democrats Congress. We'll get to what will in a second. Here, here's Bernie Sanders continuing to push this stuff forward. Democrats are always over their skis. They can't just, it's amazing. Democrats think that when people react to Republicans badly and so Democrats win, it's because Democrats have done something positive. Republicans, as we'll see, tend to do the same thing. Here is Bernie Sanders promoting student debt relief, which, again, is not going to redound to Democrats' benefit politically. 
In my view, the president did a, the right thing. Uh, and we have got to be really thinking about higher education in general. And in my view, uh, at a time when hundreds of thousands of bright young people can't even afford to go to college, if we're going to be competitive in a global economy, uh, we need to make public colleges and universities tuition free. OK, so again, none of this is going to jog Democrats to victory and, and neither is the economy, by the way. According to the Wall Street Journal, we are now running into an actual recession. They say for retailers, it's a season of discontent from Walmart to Nordstrom. Retailers have a glut of inventory and are discounting items to clear out space for holiday goods. Many have already lowered profit expectations for the year and are working to cut costs as consumers are pulling back spending in categories like apparel and home goods ahead of the key year end shopping season. Best Buy warned investors last month, shoppers are buying fewer TVs and other electronics as they pay more for gas and groceries. Macy's CEO, Jeff Gennett, said last week, customers across income levels are pulling back on purchases. Days later, Dollar General executives said people are trading down to less expensive versions of everyday items like powdered detergents and are putting more purchases on credit cards. Companies are attempting to balance serving customers who are eager to spend despite rising prices while also being sensitive to shoppers who need or want to be more budget conscious. As a result, retail executives and consultants predict the slowest sales growth in the period between November and January in years. Eric Nordstrom, chief executive of Nordstrom, said, quote, the uncertainty moving forward is significant. There's cases to be made that things could get better pretty quickly, and then there's credible cases to be made. It's going to be very, very tough. Recent economic data has muddied the picture of consumer health. Gasoline prices are down from their June peak, but are higher than a year ago. Inflation remains near four-decade highs. Unemployment, however, remains low when compared with historic averages, and wages are rising, but they're not rising as fast as inflation has been rising. Consumer spending in July increased at a slower pace than in the previous month, due in part to falling gas prices, according to government data. Meanwhile, investors are ramping up their bets against the stock market as the summer rally fizzles, according to the journal. They are now looking at the possibility of a significant volatile trading half. Net short positions against the, S- against the S&P 500 futures have grown in the past couple of months, reaching levels not seen in two years. That means traders are increasing their bets. The index will fall or at least hedging against that risk. Meanwhile, short interest has picked up in the fund tracking popular technology shares, whose recent declines have signaled a strong summer rally is stalling out. Many traders and portfolio managers are debating whether stocks climb from 2022 lows in mid-June marks the start of a new bull market or is just a dead cat bounce, a temporary bounce. The S&P 500 has risen 11% since June 16th, but remains down 15% for the year. Mark Hackett, chief of investment research for Nationwide, said there's so much skepticism, we're still in the sell the rally mentality. If everybody feels we're in a bear market rally, it will become almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. So all of these sort of positive, happy talk that you're seeing from the media about the economy, we're going to escape the recession, it's not going to be bad. The stock market doesn't believe that. The retailers don't believe that. That's not going to redound to Democrats' benefit either. You know what else is not going to redound to their benefit is, is their answer to this. This is, I think, the funniest article of the weekend. This came at courtesy of the Associated Press. Fed tackles inflation with its most diverse leadership ever. And this is the this is the Democratic Party platform right here. We're really bad at it, but the people doing it are gay, black, and Native American. We're really crappy at this thing, but it's a diverse crowd of people who are crappy at this thing, which makes it not crappy. Yeah, guys, you're doing a bang-up job. According to the Associated Press, when Diane Swank first attended the Federal Reserve's annual economic conference in Jackson Hole in the late 1990s, there was a happy hour for women who attended the event. It barely filled a single table. Now, the Women at Jackson Hole Happy Hour draws dozens of female economists and high-level decision makers from the United States and overseas. I'm just glad now there's a line for the ladies' room, said Swank, a longtime Fed watcher who is chief economist for the accounting giant KPMG. It's not just at Jackson Hole, but also in the Fed's boardroom, where its leadership has become its most diverse ever. There are more female, black, and openly gay officials contributing to the central bank's interest rate decisions than at any time in its 109-year history. You're doing an amazing job, guys. 40-year highs in inflation. You completely blew it. But there are a lot of black gay people here. Over time, economists say, a wider range of voices will deepen the Fed's perspective as it weighs the consequences of raising or lowering rates. It may help diversify a profession that historically hasn't been seen as particularly welcoming to women and minorities. Man, if you are picking who gets to run the United States economy based on ethnic and sexual orientation calculations, I have very little faith that you're going to be good at this. No one picks their doctor based on race. No one picks their plumber based on race. You should not pick the people who run the Federal Reserve based on whether they are men who like to have sex with men. This seems like a very stupid way of doing economic policy. Maybe the guy running the Federal Reserve, maybe he's best if he is gay, but it's not because he's gay. What, what in the world? 
broadly. That's helpful, said William English, former senior economist at the Fed who teaches at Yale School of Management. There's evidence that diverse groups make better decisions. No, there's evidence that a group of people with diverse perspectives make better decisions. There is no evidence that, that people in a group are better off because some are gay and some are straight, depending on what they are attempting to do. What are you even talking about? So they're doing a crap job, but they're diverse, which again is just that that's the important thing. The Fed's influential seven member board of governors based in Washington now includes two black economists. Ooh, ah, they're the third and fourth black people on the board. Governors get to vote on every Fed rate decision. Also, Biden elevated Lil Brainerd, a governor since 2014, to the board's powerful vice chair position. Two of the presidents of the Fed's 12 regional banks are now black. Five of the regional bank presidents are women. Nella Richardson, chief economist at the payroll processing firm ADP, noted the education and experience of the new policymakers are similar to their predecessors. With Cook, Jefferson, and Collins, all PhD economists, Richardson suggested having more women in the Fed's leadership is particularly important now because many of the problems the central bank faces are related to women's ability to join the workforce. But what is a woman? They can't even name that. There are not enough trans people on the Federal Reserve. I know that that was chief, like, top of it. So what should all, all of this should spell the Democrats would be doing badly, right? The economy is not doing well. Joe Biden is an unpopular president. Their cultural radicalism is bad. Democrats are capable of blowing elections. This we have seen. But Republicans are doing an amazing job of blowing the 2022 election. There's something that you'd never want to blow, and that is your home insurance. Okay, your home insurance is something that by law you actually have to have, and you might be spending too much money for it right now. So how can you get the insurance you need at the price that you want? You need Policy Genius. Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need. You click the link in the description, head on over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro Home to get started. Policy Genius will show you price estimates for policies that fit your search. If you like what they find, they'll get you switched over for free. Customers who bundled their home and auto policies with Policy Genius saved an average of 1,250 bucks per year over what they were paying. The team at Policy Genius, they're on hand at every step to help you make the decisions that you need to make with confidence. They work for you, not the insurance companies. So they are not working for the people who you're attempting to get a deal from. They're not going to add on extra fees. They don't sell your information to third parties. And they've earned thousands of five-star reviews from both Google and Trustpilot. So get started today by heading on over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro Home. Get your free home and auto insurance quotes. See how much you could save today by bundling those things. Home and auto insurance from Policy Genius, policygenius.com slash Shapiro Home. But meanwhile, have you been continuing to give your money to woke razor companies that hate your values and see masculinity as toxic and think you should teach your daughter to shave her beard? There is, in fact, a better way. Jeremy's razors. They're 100% real and 100% fabulous. The premium matte tungsten handle has more heft than the left. The razor head pivots without caving. It has six blades that are sharper than truth itself. Those other razor companies that keep virtue signaling to the totalitarian left, and they're using your cash to do it. Why would you let them do that? Instead, get a great shave with Jeremy's razors and don't contribute to people who hate your guts. 75,000 people have already made the switch. Become one of them. Visit jeremysrazors.com. Get your Founders Series shave kit today. That's jeremysrazors.com. Jeremy's razors. Shut up and shave. Well, folks, after Matt Walsh became the greatest best-selling LGBTQ plus minus divided by sign, ampersand, hashtag, poop emoji, children's author for his book, Johnny the Walrus, he discovered a giant stuffed walrus had been made for him as a gift. But that gift was never given to him. I don't know where it is. It sounds great. In fact, anyone would be lucky to have their own. And now you can. This Johnny the Walrus plushie is now available at the Daily Wire shop. This cuddly companion makes the perfect gift for anyone who's enjoyed the book or even just like their own walrus. Head on over to dailywire.com slash shop or click the link in the description to bring home your very own walrus today. It would be a crime to deny anyone a walrus as wonderful and endearing as this particular walrus. You'll love the walrus. Your friends will love the walrus. Everyone loves the walrus. Dailywire.com slash shop. So we've talked about the democratic myth-making here, that the reason that they're rising again is because of Joe Biden or student loans, and that if they just keep going with the cultural progressivism, this is not going to hurt them in any way, because again, the new norm in American politics is that emerging democratic minority majority coalition. None of that's true. Okay, what is happening right here is the Democrats are rising because, again, of abortion. The, the abortion issue, obviously, in the polling data is having some impact on Democratic turnout. It's having heavy, but there's a combo that's happening right here. It's not just that Democrats are turning out at a higher rate. It's that since June, and really since August, Republicans are turning out at a lower rate. Republicans are not showing up as much as they were in special elections prior to Dobbs, and specifically prior to the Trump Mar-a-Lago raid. So what, what has happened with the Republicans is because Republicans bought into the same mythos as Democrats, they're making a lot of mistakes. So the Democratic mistakes based on that emerging Democratic minority majority theory, where we can be as culturally progressive as we want, 
Wrong. We can spend as much money as we could possibly want to spend. Wrong. We can, we can put up a dead person as president of the United States who is unpopular. Wrong. All three of those are wrong. But Democrats are gaining right now because Republicans, all they had to do, as always, in a bi, in a, in a polar environment, in a, in a situation in which everyone is reactionary, all Republicans had to do was stand there and point at Democrats. And when they were standing there and pointing at Democrats, they were doing great. When, when Republicans, up until about June, July, August, until that point, they were just pointing at Joe Biden and saying, look, inflation. Look, foreign policy catastrophe. Look, cultural insanity. That's what these people are. Why would you vote for them? Come vote for us. No one knew the names of the Republican candidates. Nobody cared who the Republican candidates were. Because, again, usually an election is a referendum on the people in power. But there's something else going on inside the Republican coalition. And that is because they bought into this mythos that the Democrats in a normal, non-wave year, are just going to win because of this magic coalition they built. The only person who can defeat them is a person with magic in his fingertips. The only person who can defeat them is Trump. He's the only one, right? Trump, because Trump was the magic man, right? In 2016, he defeated, against all odds, against all the polls, Hillary Clinton. And it was, it was a signal moment in American politics. I don't know if you remember that night. Everyone was shocked, including Donald Trump. There were like two guys who said they weren't shocked and they were lying to you. It was a shocking election result. And you've got very few of those in American politics, truly shocking election results. It was so shocking that Democrats couldn't accept it, right? Trump must have cheated. He must have participated with the Russians. Even the Democrats thought it was magic. They thought it was some sort of evil black magic that Donald Trump had become president. It was Vladimir Putin in the back room figuring out how Donald Trump had become president, right? It was, it was some sort of extraneous, weird thing that Donald Trump had become president. When in reality, it was actually, in retrospect, predictable in the sense only that Hillary Clinton was a wildly unpopular candidate, had been for years, and that a lot of Republicans showed up to vote specifically because of the Democratic myth-making in 2012. It turns out you can't just ignore the entire white majority in the United States and castigate them as racist and get away with it in the United States as a typical electoral rule. Okay, so Trump wins in 2016. And so the myth on the right is, again, in a normal election, Democrats win. You need magic man here in order to win. What this means is that all of Republican politics has now circulated around Trump. And, and so for a lot of Republicans, the idea was that now that things were kind of going back to normal, right? At the beginning of the year, things were kind of going back to normal. Trump was no longer president of the United States. He hadn't been president for a year. Whatever he was doing over on Truth Social, fulminating over stuff, that was his business. And the, the Republican base still liked Trump. They weren't anti-Trump. But it was that there was this growing idea when you looked at the polls that Democrats had overshot the mark. There's a certain awakening that was occurring in the Republican brain in which they were saying, oh, Democrats actually are unpopular. It turns out it's not about Trump. They're just bad at this. And all we have to do is stand here. And then came the Trump Mar-a-Lago raid. I think the Trump Mar-a-Lago raid has a lot to do with the dynamic in politics that you're seeing right now. Because for Republicans, the idea had become, okay, we'll get ready for 2024. Maybe, you know, maybe it'll be Trump, maybe it'll be somebody else. But the main narrative is not going to be Trump as the magical savior of all that is good in the United States versus this emerging Democratic majority. It's going to be looked at. The underlying dynamics have changed. Right? Even people who are very pro-Trump were saying, more Hispanics are voting Republican now. Right? The actual math has changed. The entire theory of the case Democrats were, were, were purveying since 2012 is wrong. It's not true. And then came the Mar-a-Lago raid. And when the Mar-a-Lago raid happened, everything sort of snapped back into place. Because if there's one thing that Democrats can do to drive Republicans batty, it is that anybody Democrats attack, Republicans immediately heroize. They immediately valorize. They immediately turn into the center of the narrative. Right? If Democrats decide that Marjorie Taylor Greene is the worst human being on planet Earth, Republicans will not immediately respond by saying, well, you know, she says some stuff I don't like. She says some stuff I do like, and they're really overshooting the mark. That's not how Republicans respond. They immediately respond by going, she is the greatest person I have ever seen in my life. And so when Trump was raided, two things can be true at once. One, it looks extraordinarily political. I've been saying this since the day the raid happened. And two, it can refocus everybody on the thing that nobody focuses on in the election normally. Donald Trump. It turns out people vote against things. Democrats right now are voting against Trump. They're voting against the Republicans, they're, they're voting against pro-life laws. They're vote, they have a lot of things that they can vote against come the midterm elections. Republicans were getting set to vote against Joe Biden. And that was a big thing. They were voting against Joe Biden and they were voting against Democrats. They were voting against all the things we talked about before. You know what you can't vote against, really? The FBI. You know what you can't really vote against? The quote unquote deep state in the sense that Donald Trump being targeted, two things can be true at once. One, it can be a selective prosecution, politically motivated, pretty obviously before an election. And two, 
the rationale for Donald Trump's activity that's leading to the investigation is almost inexplicable. Like I haven't, the one thing I've never, I haven't heard from Team Trump. And again, this does not justify what the FBI is doing to him. It doesn't explain why the DOJ signed off on a raid. It doesn't explain what the importance of what they are doing is, you know, beyond sort of the, the normal, we, we, we want to enforce the law, but only selectively speaking. It doesn't explain any of that. But what no one can understand is what Trump is doing. So if you're a Republican and before you were motivated to get out and vote against the Democrats, right now you're just sort of mad about other things. And you can see this in the polling data. What you can see in the polling data is that Republicans are less likely to go to the polls today because, again, they're invested in the magic man narrative. And what this means is that they are now centralizing around Trump. Trump, as a part of the 2022 election, is not going to help Republicans. It's going to hurt Republicans. The center of the election has to be a referendum on Joe Biden, on the Democrats, not on the treatment of Donald Trump. When Trump is at the center of the headlines, it is not good for Republicans. That is the running theme of every poll that we are seeing right now. If the election is about abortion and Donald Trump, Republicans are in serious trouble come 2022. If the election is about Joe Biden and his handling of the economy and the crazy Democratic cultural moves that they are making, then the Democrats will lose. So this, this Trump raid actually has rejiggered the election and again, cast Republicans back into the role of let's focus on Trump. And that is a large scale electoral mistake. So the, the sort of detailed following that Republicans are doing and conservatives are doing of the Trump Mar-a-Lago raid is distracting them. It's taking their eye off the ball of what they're actually voting against. It's a bank shot, in other words. None of this, I keep saying it over and over, so I will say it one more time. None of this justifies the FBI raid against Trump. But politically speaking, if we are focused on the FBI raid against Trump, as opposed to focusing on what Democrats are doing on a daily basis to wreck the economy, as opposed to focusing on the fact that Joe Biden just unilaterally, unilaterally declared he's going to spend $500 billion that do not exist bailing out all of his buddies. If you do that, you're not going to do well in the election. And because Trump still is able to damage his political opponents inside the Republican Party more than his opponents outside the Republican Party, Trump cannot do damage to Democrats. He can only do damage to Republicans at this point. This is what you've seen in a series of primaries where he has endorsed a candidate who goes on to win, and then the candidate runs very weak against the Democrat. And Donald Trump's handpicked candidates are the ones that are doing the worst in terms of the polling data right now in the 2022 senatorial election. The more Trump is at the center, and the more he is the locus of the Republican solar system, the worse things are for them, electorally speaking. But again, when you're invested in the idea that Trump was the magic, when, that he was the wizard, in 2016, and that he will always be a wizard. What this leads to is faith in a thing that, electorally speaking, is not true. Okay, so here is what's happening right now. Everyone is focusing in on Trump Mar-a-Lago, but no. And, and so there is a theory. This is going to get Republicans very fired up for the election. There's only one problem: when people go after Trump for being president of the United States, what Republicans think is they're going after him because they want to stop him from doing the things that are good for the country. When people go after Trump for randomly having documents in his home that he maybe shouldn't have there. People are like, okay, I see what they're doing. They're trying to get him out in 2024. But why did he have documents in his home? Like, what, what, is, the, what is the thing that he was trying to do? This is the answer that nobody can give on, on sort of the Trump side of the aisle. What was he doing here? Sure, the FBI better have damned good justification for doing what they were doing. But what exactly was Donald Trump doing with a bunch of documents in his house? Even if it was just stupidity or sloppiness, like why? Is this a controversy that needs to be at the center of American politics right now? It's a very confusing thing. Was, it, was he doing something super important and the Democrats stopped him? Or are they using as, as an excuse to go after him what was going on? But also like, why was he doing that? Like what? what? So right now, the latest in, in the Trump FBI raid stuff is that according to Politico, a federal judge said Saturday she's inclined to grant Donald Trump's request to bring in an outsider to oversee the review of more than two dozen boxes of materials the FBI seized from the former president's Florida estate earlier this month. In her brief order, which she emphasized was not a final decision, U.S. District Court Judge Eileen Cannon also directed the DOJ to produce by Tuesday a more detailed list of items seized from Trump's residence on August 8th, as well as the status of the government's ongoing review of those materials, which includes the use of a filter team to screen for attorney-client privileged records. The FBI executed, of course, the search warrant on Mar-a-Lago aimed at recovering what the magistrate judge said were highly classified documents in Trump's possession. Now, Cannon was nominated by Trump, confirmed by the Senate. She, should, she said she plans to hold a hearing Thursday in West Palm Beach on the former president's request for a special master. It is likely that he will receive the special master. But this is not actually clearing up what exactly Trump was, because what we now know is that Trump's own lawyers had encouraged him to turn over documents 
to the DOJ and to, to the National Archives early in, in this year. And Trump wouldn't do it. He said, no, these are my documents. I'm keeping them. So people on the right side of the aisle can defend Trump, but they really don't know what he was doing. So this is leaving them in sort of a, a weird position of making the top item on their election agenda Donald Trump's personal behavior, which is, which is strange. It's odd, and it's not likely to lead to electoral victory, certainly not in an environment where you could be running against the Democrats as opposed to against the FBI or against the Trump FBI raid or, or all the, re the rest of this. I mean, I'll just give you an example. So George Stephanopoulos, he was questioning Senator Roy Blunt from Missouri on Trump's handling of the documents. And Blunt kept saying the FBI shouldn't have raided his, his house, which is true. And Stephanopoulos just kept saying, so why do you have the documents? Blunt doesn't know. I mean, hell, Trump might not even know. But, it, but if that's the center of the election, that's not going to, I mean, again, I'm, I'm just reading the polling data, folks. I know that a lot of Republicans would like to believe that if Trump remains the center of American politics, it's good for the Republicans. I just see no evidence of that from the polling data at this point. I see no evidence that that was the case in the Senate in 2020. I see no evidence that that is the case right now in the Senate. I see no evidence that's the case in the House. Here's George Stephanopoulos going after Roy Blunt because of Trump. Whether or not these documents were classified, was it right for the president to take these government documents, which he's supposed to turn over to the National Archives, down to Mar-a-Lago? Uh, it was, you should be very careful with classified documents. I've been, had access to documents like that for a long time. I'm incredibly careful. I was wondering as I was listening to that discussion if the same things were said uh, when Secretary Clinton had documents, when Director Comey had documents. They had them on the internet, which is much more dangerous than having them in a box somewhere, but everybody needs to be more careful. Well, you're still not, you're not answering any question. You were critical of Senator Clinton, who actually turned over uh, what she had, turned over all her devices. What we have here is a situation where the president did not turn over uh, these documents. Can you say whether that was right or, or right or wrong? Do you believe it was right for the president to take those documents to Mar-a-Lago? He should have turned the documents over and apparently had turned a number of documents over. Again, this is, it's, it's, it's a sticky situation for Republicans. You can believe all these things at once. FBI shouldn't have raided him. Hillary Clinton got away with it. Donald Trump should have turned over the documents. All of these things you could actually believe. And by the way, again, when it comes to the polling data, which is the thing that if you're a conservative, you should care about. You should care about who controls Congress. Considering the Democrats are nosediving this country directly into the ground, you should mostly be concerned about whether you guys are going to win an election. Look at the polling data. New poll out from CBS News. It says that the FBI search hasn't directly changed many votes because of the sharp partisan splits over it. It could be part of a larger issue holding back Republicans because Trump is a big positive for his own partisans, but they were voting Republican anyway. But Trump is a net negative for independents. Independents would, refer, would prefer that Republicans criticize Trump rather than supporting him in Mar-a-Lago. Half of independent voters named Trump as a factor in their vote. Four to one, they are voting to oppose him. Far worse than Biden's support oppose ratio. Four to one. So for independents, which is half of them, who say that Trump is a factor in their decision-making. Four to one, they say that they're going to oppose Trump. Is that good for, for Republicans anywhere in here? They sh this election should be about Joe Biden and nothing but Joe Biden and entirely Joe Biden. And instead, you haven't heard Biden's name in the past six weeks since the Trump Mar-a-Lago raid, except for the media praising him to the skies for the stuff that he's actually doing policy-wise. And meanwhile, Republicans are caught up in how do we show that we think that the FBI raid is really bad? What can we say to get Trump off our backs? What can we do here? You can rip the Trump FBI raid. You can, and you should. But you can still point out that if you guys are distracted on the Trump FBI raid, that is going to not be a winning issue for you. How many elections can Republicans blow on the basis of we need to focus in on Trump rather than focusing in on the other issues? This happened, by the way, in 2018 as well. If you recall in 2018, Republicans were doing shockingly well on the generic congressional ballot. They were doing really, really well on the congressional generic. Like people... Couldn't explain it. It was right after there was a, a big surge. Democrats were doing well. And then the Kavanaugh hearings happened. And suddenly the country focused in on the injustice done to Brett Kavanaugh and what the Democrats were doing. And you saw an actual surge in the polls for Republicans. And Donald Trump stepped in in 2018. And he said, we're going to make this thing about my stance on the border and illegal immigration. And then Republicans got your act. Right? The last three weeks of the election was all about Trump. They did really poorly. 2020, Donald Trump intervened directly in the Georgia senatorial elections. And Georgia loses two Senate seats and make the difference between Joe Biden spending $7 trillion and not spending $7 trillion. And now we are looking at this becoming the center of the election again. And that's just, a, I'm, I'm sorry, but that is just a mistake by the Republicans. 
If Republicans buy into the mythology that they can't win without Donald Trump in any way, shape or form, and thus every time Trump is mentioned, anytime they go after him, that has to become the center of American politics because without him, everything falls apart. That's not true. In fact, the reverse is true. If Republicans decide that this is the way they want to run, and this is not saying Trump shouldn't be the nominee in 2024. It's not saying you shouldn't like Trump. It's not saying you shouldn't support Trump. It's not saying that you shouldn't fight the FBI's raid on Trump. It's not saying you can't think that Joe Biden and Merrick Garland are doing something eminently political and going after Trump. But if every word that comes out of your mouth as a Republican candidate and as a party is Donald Trump, do you think it's going to benefit the Republicans or do you think it's going to benefit the Democrats? This is why a lot of people are very sanguine on the Republican side of the aisle about 2024. They're like, oh, if Trump gets nominated and it's Trump versus Biden again in 2024, Trump's going to win. I, I don't see the evidence that that is particularly the case. Like, can you show me evidence that that is the case? Because here's the thing that I care about, stopping the Democrats. This is the thing that you should care about also as a conservative. The key statistic here is that in 2016, when Donald Trump ran for president, independents who decided on the last day who they were voting for split two to one in favor of Donald Trump. By 2020, independents who were deciding on the last day split two to one in favor of Joe Biden. So do you want that on the tip of your notes? Again, Democrats can blow this because of all their underlying issues. On a systemic level, what Roy Teixeira says is correct. On a systemic level, when Roy Teixeira says the underlying systemic problems for the Democratic Party are serious and growing worse. And the big problem for the Republicans is that they are centralizing around a person who, by all available statistics, is not particularly popular in the United States except with the base. That's correct. So perhaps there ought to be some care taken with the issues that Republicans make front and center. So if you're a Republican candidate, if you are the Republican Party, more broadly speaking, there's only one name that should be on your lips from now until November. Joe Biden, that is the only name that should be on your lips. Doesn't mean if you're asked about Trump, you can't say, I don't think the FBI rate is justified. It should be about Joe Biden and Joe Biden alone. Because the Democratic Party, they are making some awfully brutal mistakes. And if you don't take advantage of them, your mistake is even larger. And you can see this, by the way, in Florida. So Florida, the, the Republican Party in Florida is doing really, really well. So the same day that there was this election over in, in New York, in which Republicans underperformed. There was one state where Republicans did not underperform. That state was Florida. If you're looking at the special elections, so there was a, an election day in Florida last week. During that election day, Charlie Crist won the nomination to go up against Ron DeSantis for governor. And there was a lot of talk on the Democrats. Look at how many people showed up to vote for Charlie Crist. Wow, it was like 1.5 million people showed up in the Democratic primaries. And that was a pretty hotly contested Democratic primary between Nikki Freed, who's a crazy person, and Charlie Crist, who has literally been a member of every political party on the planet. He's, I think, been a member of the Bath Party at this point, Charlie Crist. He was a Republican, then he was an independent. Now he's a Democrat. He was a member of the Green Party. He's been a member of the Reform Party. Like, I don't know what Charlie Crist, that guy plays all sides of the field. Anyway, Charlie Crist wins against Nikki Freed. 1.5 million Democrats show up to vote. There is no contested election on the Republican side of the aisle. None on a statewide level. 1.6 million Republicans show up to vote. Voter turnout in Florida for the Republicans was higher without a contested election on the ballot than it was for Democrats with a contested election on the ballot. Meanwhile, Republicans swept through the local school boards in Florida. They picked up a bevy of local school boards, including in heavily blue areas. So what exactly is the Republican Party in Florida doing that the Republican Party elsewhere is not doing? Well, the thing that the Republican Party in Florida is doing is focusing in on Florida governance. Governor DeSantis is doing a very good job of focusing in on the educational predations of the left, on the wokeness of the left, on the attempt to weaponize corporations against the people of Florida. He's focusing in on his citizens, on local issues, on the things that people actually care about. And so Republicans in Florida are jazzed, not by the Trump FBI raid. They're jazzed because of all the other things. That is a, that is a very important thing. And that means that DeSantis is in excellent position, for example, to run against Charlie Crist. The polls show that he's up eight to 10 points against Charlie Crist. And it also means that he can point out Charlie Crist's vulnerabilities. So Charlie Crist just pointed, uh, just picked for his, uh, for his running mate the head of United Teachers of Dade, which is just the stupidest thing you can do. Because what Ron DeSantis has done is run directly against the teachers unions in the state of Florida. He has said the teachers unions in the state of Florida tried to keep the schools closed. This is true. They tried to mask up the kids. This is true. That they have essentially decided to run directly against the interests of their own students. And Charlie Crist, meanwhile, is picking Carla Hernandez-Matz, the president of Miami's United Teachers of Dade, as his running mate. She's also vice president of the American Federation of Teachers. So she works for Randy Weingarten. She opposed reopening Florida's public schools in the middle of the pandemic. In September of 2020, according to the Wall Street Journal, the UTD organized a caravan, including a hearse, to protest reopening schools outside the Miami-Dade County School Board headquarters. 
Hernandez Mass insisted lives are going to be lost if Miami schools reopen. Florida schools did reopen, but in 2021, the AFT successfully lobbied the CDC to tighten school reopening guidelines, which kept schools elsewhere closed longer. So Chris is running the Terry McAuliffe playbook, and he's likely to lose. Again, look to the elections that Republicans have done really well in over the course of the last couple of years. Loudoun County, Virginia, school boards, local educational issues, those made the Republican governor of Virginia, a Republican governor of Virginia. In New Jersey, the, the governor of New Jersey, Phil Murphy, nearly lost to a no-name Republican. I mean, these were 13, 14 point swings. So what changed? What changed? Only a few things. Dobbs, right, which of course is going to jazz up the Democratic base, and the loss of momentum for the Republicans because the Republicans have decided to focus their efforts elsewhere. But in the states where they're not focusing their efforts elsewhere, they continue to do really, really well. And that is true in places like Florida. All right, guys, the rest of the show is continuing right now. You're not going to want to miss it. We're going to be getting into the fact that the Republicans just received like $1.6 billion donation and Democrats are losing their minds about it. Plus, Sydney Sweeney is under attack because she has friends who apparently wear red hats. If you're not a member, click the link in the description and join us. Uh-huh. 